Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by FunkinStuff.net, this is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funkin' Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Dwayne Tudall. He's an award-winning author who's worked in entertainment more than 30 years and in recent years has written two of the most thoroughly researched, detailed, and fascinating books documenting Prince's prodigious creativity in studio sessions. A Prince fan since 1981, Tudal began writing about him in the Uptown fanzine and in 2017 published Prince and the Purple Rain era studio sessions 1983 and 1984. His second book in the series, Prince and the Parade and Sign of the Times Era Studio Sessions 1985 to 1986, will be available by the time this airs. He's a former stand-up comic who's also produced and or directed documentary programming for the History Channel, CBS, Fox, Discovery, and other media outlets. Wow, impressive. Dwayne, thank you for joining the show. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. I've been a fan of yours for a bit, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. And where are you coming to us from today? I am in Los Angeles at the moment and doing a little My stuff hometown. out here. Yep. There you are. I can see with the Lakers hat. Um, yeah, I'm out here for a little bit and uh, it's fun being out here in Los Angeles. is great. I used to live out here for about 30 years, but now it's a, it's nice in smaller doses, you know, so it's a, it's a good town. It's one of these, it's one of these places where you always feel familiar, you know, like everything you know is here. So I, I do love being out here and I got a lot of friends, although I can't see them right now. That's the problem. You know, I'm out here with my friends literally a mile away and, you know, with COVID and stuff like that, you just can't see them right now, but that'll change. Hopefully yeah. By the time yeah. this airs, you know, it all change completely. Yeah. Hopefully it's in the rear view mirror for exactly. sure. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so Dwayne, where are you from originally and what was, uh, you know, it like growing up for you? Uh, I'm from Baltimore. Uh, so I grew up, uh, back there. We had, um, it was a good town for music. Um, so I grew up with, there's a lot of stations there. Uh, you had your very, uh, 
you know, rock stations with 98 rock, but you had your funk stations with V103. And I, so I kind of tried to get a little bit of a blend of all those things. And, and back there, uh, I remember when Controversy came out and some of the music from Prince started playing and I was like, this is really good. But I've been listening to a lot of the funk uh, for a while before that, just thinking this is really good. I mean, I grew up on the Beatles and Fleetwood Mac and things like that, but then you start expanding and, and getting a good taste of what, you know, JB and the things out there. And you're like, oh, this is good too. I really like this. So I started looking into that and, and seeking it out. And then when Prince came around, um, it kind of struck me. It really hit me. And then when 1999 came out <clears throat> and I noticed that it was great for going to dances, school dances, or even college, uh, certain dances. And that's where the girls were. The girls like to dance to Prince and I wanted to be around the girls. So I was like, okay, I will. And I started listening to it and going, oh, this is actually really good. And um, then Purple Rain hit and that kind of, you know, that was it. You know, it was uh, the summer of uh, 84 was just huge for um, that kind of music. And just, it, it, I, w I was, I already was a fan, but that locked it in. Right, and, right. And yes, yeah. And the nice so, thing is funny, it's funny before we go, I, I want to say that the one thing that's fun about Prince is it wasn't like one of those bubble gum acts where you like it for a bit and all of a sudden it goes away and everybody's like, ah, kind of looking back on it. It's one of those things that just ends up becoming a, a lifetime thing. And then there's certain people that get into it, not just for a certain album or two, but they get into it for the ride, the whole ride. And so sometimes you like the albums more and sometimes you don't. And sometimes there's a tour you really want to see more. And then sometimes you go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to step back from this one just slightly, but, but there's it's a it's a lifetime commitment to a lot of people and i'm definitely one of those guys so well baltimore i've only been there a few times uh in maryland but uh, i do know that there's some good funk that came out of there because oh, yeah. you know there's a whole uh sort of uh segment of p-funk you yes. know that was like the second or third wave of players that came Absolutely. out of baltimore so definitely there's some good right. funk from there Right. And DC had uh, go go, had a lot of things like that. So you had right next to their city is literally about 45 minutes from each other. So you had a good scene in DC, a great scene in Baltimore, and, and you know, everything in between. It was, and, and uh, like I said, a cross of everything. So it was kind of a fun, fun city to be from. I say that to be from because once I realized I was free to leave, I left, <laughs> you know, so. Oh, there's no fence at the end. I could just keep walking. Great. But, but I, 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 every time I go back to Baltimore, I love it. Well, the Colts get... left. So, you know, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> it's funny. I moved out to Los Angeles and then their teams left and everybody, all my fans are saying, I don't move up to San Francisco. We like the Niners, you know? So I, I, uh, I apparently am bad luck for uh, football teams. <laughs> yeah. So I know. What do you remember the very first time you heard Prince? Uh, yeah, it was the song controversy. And, uh, and I just still that do, 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 uh, that that riff, which is so basic, but it, it stays with you. I remember hearing that on the radio and thinking, what is this? You know, because it was like, I like the funk, but that was like, there was something about that and it's infectious. And, and I, I remember um, making up, I didn't remember the song. I didn't remember what the words were controversy. And I was making up words for it, you know. And, and, you know, I just knew the, do, 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 do. And, and the fun thing is Prince ended up using that same kind of riff for several different songs over time, you know, for the family and things like that. He would go back to that kind of play. And, and, and it was just, like I said, it's, it's just infectious. It's, it stay, it's, it stays in your head. And when I heard that, I thought, okay, I want to know more about this guy. Um, so I went back and listened to Dirty Mind, which is different than Controversy. And then I was open at 1999 when that came out and I was going, well, that's different than this. And you started to realize that um, I'm a big David Bowie fan. And I, one of the things I like about David Bowie is it was a, every album was different. And I started seeing that with Prince going, oh, okay, you're going to make a different, not character each time, but a different outlook where a lot of musicians will do the same album over and over and over, you know, and, and sometimes that's really good. Um, but there's something about Prince that you go, oh, okay, this sounds different than this. This sounds different than that. And it's, there's, it, it makes you as a, as a fan, it, it's more intriguing because you then seek this out and you want to get everything from that era if you like it. So with Purple Rain came out, there was, you know, all the B-sides and then Around the World in a Day came out and then you had the, um, for the tears in your eyes and all this stuff. And you're just going, 
I, I'm insatiable. I'm, I want yeah. all this stuff. And that's that. I think that's what a lot of Prince fans go through is they're, they're given an album a year, which is still a great pace. I mean, that that's, I still laugh about how spoiled we were when it came to getting a, an album or a double album every year. And, and, and uh, protégés too. Yeah, exactly. On top of it, exactly. Uh, for the, it's funny, I was, I was looking at in the, in the first book I wrote, in a six month period, he did uh, part of the time, uh, Ice Cream Castle, did um, Apollonia 6, did uh, stuff for Stevie Nicks, did the rest of Purple Rain, did um, The Family, um, and, and all, all this within like a six, seven, eight month period. Four or five amazing collections. And you just sit there going, any one of these would be career defining. And, and yet he did it kind of, in a, you know, just, you know, and you just, it, it's mind blowing how much that guy would write and, and record, not just write, because anybody can write a song, but writing a good song and writing a good song for another band and then recording them and just getting them to do vocals or something like that. It's just, it, it, it's almost too much to try to, to try to memorize it all because there's just so much to it, but I'm, not going to complain about the bulk of the material we got, you know. So, yeah, you know, um, I was first exposed to him when Soft and Wet came out in '78 because mm -hmm. I was already a funk fan listening to that music. Yeah. Yeah. But he was the first one where I was able to become a fan and follow him from day one, you know, wow. whereas the other people, wow. you know, I came to P Funk and I came to the Ohio Players and I came to Earth, Wind, and Fire, they were already entities, you know, and they were right. already well into their careers. So to follow Prince from that beginning stage and see those changes you're talking about and the evolution and the pushing of boundaries, it was just, I had never seen or experienced anything like it. And as it turns out, there really has not been anything like it. And I don't think there will be. I mean, I really don't think now that he's gone, I really don't think there's anybody that's going to replace him because you know, oftentimes people say, oh, Terrence Trent Darby is the next Prince or whoever it is. And as much as I like Terrence Trent Darby and his first album was fantastic, he wasn't Prince. And each time you keep thinking, oh, this person is going to be, and they, they just aren't. And they may do great stuff, but Prince was so prolific and so talented and could do, you know, you don't get on the cover of Guitar Player Magazine, Bass Player Magazine, Drum Magazine, Keyboard Magazine on a whim. You have to have skills to get on top on, on all those magazine covers. And I don't know if anybody's been on all four except Prince, you know, when it comes to that stuff. He's just that good. Oh, and then throwing in soul, throwing, you know, uh, rock, pop, um, and even country. It's kind of like the, could... the instrumental EGOT or something, you know? <laughs> That's true. Exactly. It is the EGOT. Yeah, the e exactly. So it just, it is, it, it's funny because I, as much as he's praised, I still feel like it's almost not enough. Mm -hmm. And if that makes sense, and I, I have friends that ask me why Prince, and I'm like, just watch the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and watch his guitar work on that. Just that, just the three minutes, and, and you'll understand that part. And then I'll show you this, and then I'll play you this, and it's just there's just so much. And what's fun about Prince is he's got such a wide range. Something you may like, I may not, but it doesn't mean that we can't both be fans of him because he's just got that much range on his stuff. I know people that I love the time. I love the time, but I know people that's like, oh, the time's okay. I like this. And I'm like, okay. I'm not a big fan of his slow songs, but I know people that love his slow songs. I like his more upbeat songs, but that's just a personal taste. I, I, I enjoy the slow songs, but I just like his energetic anthem type songs. So, but, yeah, and, just, and, and Dwayne, you mentioned, you know, like David Bowie being a David Bowie fan. And, you know, it always, one of the fascinating aspects, so many, the myriad fascinating aspects to Prince is you know the, the fans the diversity in their tastes and preferences for other artists i mean i would see lists from people of other artists that they are also fans of and be like how does that connect with prince or i can you know wow that is like really out there and not close to what i'm also a fan of right i grew up my first concert was the band kiss and and it's not funk it's it's like a bubblegum metal but it was, it hit me back. It was my first show and I still like a wide variety of music. I worked for a radio station in Baltimore in college at Towson State. Um, and the radio station, our motto was from Bach to rock. And so we played everything. And I kind of felt like that was my taste too. I could listen to Mozart. 
and I could listen to, you know, the monkeys and enjoy them both. And so it's, it's a, a wide variety. And I think that people who enjoy music enjoy Prince. You know, I had a, a girlfriend in college who used to say that she loved the dead. And I was never a fan of the dead, but she, her argument was, how can you like music? How can you like music and not like the dead? And I was like, I guess that's how I feel about Prince. You know, when it comes to this, how can you not appreciate talent and not recognize that in Prince? That's sort of my, my thought on that. And, and the cool thing is he could go on stage with anybody and play with them seamlessly and then show, show off and then step back. But either way, he would always do this. And, and I, I don't remember who it was, but I want to say it was Monty Moyer who said, every time Prince walked on stage, the stage rose about a foot. And I thought that makes, that's exactly how I feel when I see him. There's a, a, a level and everybody sits up straight. Oh, Prince is here. <laughs> Better look busy. You know, it's like, there's something about what he brought to the game that everybody recognized, whether it's critics, fans, or other musicians, <laughs> they all recognized that this guy had this it. And I don't know how to explain it. We, we, it. And when you talk about those earlier records, like you were from the, you know, uh, self-titled to the sure. Dirty Mind, to the Controversy, to the 1990, sure. to Purple Rain. At the time, I was like, wow, this guy is evolving exponentially from like one record to the next. Right, and there's right. only a year between them. And, and, and then each successive release would come out. And I'd be like, I had no idea he could even do that. I, know. I mean, we didn't even hear his regular register until 1999 album. I know. You know he was mostly all singing falsetto. falsetto. Exactly. You know, it is it's um, it is phenomenal to watch the growth of the guy, and and we were lucky enough to be able to live this in real life. You know, to watch this and have a year to soak it in like a biscuit. You know, and 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 absorb it. But then when the next one hits, you're going, oh wait, I didn't see that coming. But it's almost like it was a natural progression. We we're ready. Okay, we've we've accepted here. You know, it's and, and we're going to go to the next thing. But man, the times that he would do a left turn, and you're just going, whoa! How did that happen? Sign of the times, what? And and all of a sudden, but then, okay. And and it was like he was months ahead of us for releasing. And by the time we got into it, he probably had already moved on to the next thing. Like you know, had already recorded half of his next album. But that's the way he was. I mean, he had already started in the first book. I talk about how, I know the second book. He talked about. I talked about how. Um, Parade was basically recorded about two weeks after the Purple Rain tour was over, really, you know, over. And that's still, he still had just released Around the World Day. So the tour ends, he's touring Purple Rain. The tour ends, days later, he comes out with Around the World Day. And two or three days after that, he's basically got 80% of the Parade album done. And you're just saying, oh my, how, how on earth... Do, do not just sit there and go, ah, I think I'll take an afternoon off, put my feet up, put my healed feet up, you know, and, and he didn't. And I think that's, we're benefiting from that now and, and at the time, but the work ethic of this guy and the, and the demands he made, not only himself, but everybody around him. And if you could keep up with him, you kept your job. And if you couldn't, you found another job, you know, so it's it, it's mind blowing how much this guy did over forty years. You know, nobody, nobody does it like that. Nobody did it like that, and nobody will do it like that. Period. Made James Brown, who's the hardest working man in show business, look like he was taking an afternoon off sometimes. You know, and I like James Brown. I love James Brown, but man, this guy worked it. Whew. And and he, and he honed his uh, performance craft so much too in those earlier years, especially like the first half of the eighties, yeah. and. Um, um, I felt like also not only did he uh, have these exponential uh, advances from project to project, but even his uh, ability at playing guitar and some of the things he did musically that way, you know, not only in his songwriting, but also just in his skill level, I thought yes. kept advancing. And I was like, who does that? I don't remember listening to any other artists where you can hear them actually, they're already at this level. Right. And, and they're still growing. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, it's, 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 you listen to the guitar work on some of this stuff and, and you, you know, you hear his influences through a lot of the stuff you hear, listen to the cross and you'll hear a little bit of Santana. You listen to uh, <clears throat> a lot of things. So he is absorbing it, but then perfecting it. And, and I mean, I like some of the songs in the early albums and I think they sound great live, 
but you there's a, a a rawness to the early stuff that is just almost innocent and even though he's singing some of the songs about sister and stuff like that there's still almost an innocence about his playing and and the and the delivery but you can hear him get more and more complex and by purple rain you hear that he's adding you know an extra 24 tracks to his thing and you hear he's okay we're gonna add you know strings to this okay that's something new um and and there's it's funny because I, I think I was saying this the other day around the world in a day which I love the album is really his last real innocent album because he recorded most of that before he recorded um, Purple Rain or before he released Purple Rain not before he recorded Purple Rain but before he released Purple Rain and it's his last time before he was Prince you know he was still Prince with the possibility of failure because by the time he recorded you know released. Purple Rain, there was always the op possibility that the movie would tank and you never knew and he could become a punchline. But, but when he released it, it was, you know, after Purple Rain was already released and big, but it was recorded before that. So there was a um, um, an introspective thing uh, that he had that was a guy that wasn't jaded by mega success yet. You know, and, and I, so that's why I love that era. I, I'm, I grew up in the 80s too. So it's like, you know, the... the like any music you were talking about, the Ohio players and stuff like that, that's stuff that you associate with certain things. This is where I was going to school. This is who I was dating. This is where I was eating that day. You know, it's 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 in your DNA. And and I think the 80s Prince for me is largely my DNA because I can remember specifically where I was living, who I was dating, where I bought the albums, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I mean, I'll look through my collection now and I'll see albums. I don't know where I got them going. I, I must have bought that one day, you know, and binge um but i can look at most of the stuff i got from the 80s and go yes i remember the store i remember the day i got it and that kind of stuff and i think they think it's it, it lives inside of you you got a bigger wing of your head for that stuff and your heart so that's sure. you know that's where my that's where my heart is my heart is in 70s music and 80s music and then after that is everything else so. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh for me and for a lot of uh guys who are into funk from the 70s he was like a savior in the eighties and beyond because mm -hmm. he so much kept the funk alive, oh, yeah. real funk yeah. and real musicianship. Right. So uh, for that reason, you know, not even just being, you know, uh, a child of the eighties or a music fan of the eighties, just the way he kept that going was so important. And, and he progressed. I mean, like you said, you know, it was each album was different and not necessarily funk. You know, he brought, it was, you know, the sign of the times has some funk, but it's, it's, it's more soul. You know rhythm and blues or something like that or, or or even some pop he was able to blend all these things you know seamlessly jazz throw in some jazz on the family album or madhouse which is marginally jazz you know um i mean it's 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 considered a jazz album i think most jazz musicians would probably say yeah it's not really a jazz album but you know i think it's what he wanted to present as prince jazz and i i love madhouse you know i think it's fun but it's the interesting thing for me is it's a saxophone album, you know, with, with Eric Leeds, but Prince could have just chosen to do guitar instead of sax and made the same album with, you know, slightly different and have a different tone to it by just, you know, making the lead instrument instead of lead voice, instead of being sax, make it a guitar or make it, you know, something else. He could have done that, but he went with Eric Leeds in this and decided I'm going to team up with him and make his, what he felt was jazz at the time. I guess um, if you're looking at it that way, sort of like the news album later would be more like sort of Madhouse, but with more guitar than. Yeah, I would sex. say that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And and he was doing stuff before Madhouse with you know there was some instrumental stuff on the family. Um, yes, is one of my favorite songs that he did like that. I just there's something about that. Just every time I hear it, I'm I just want to move, you know. And and so he and then he did the flesh stuff before that with uh, never came out where he had. Levi and Wendy and Lisa and Eric Leeds and Sheila and and in the studio just kind of playing and just doing stuff and they would do maybe a, a Hendrix cover of Villanova Junction or something like that and and that was fun to hear him going and 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 experimenting with that and using that to launch Madhouse eventually and things like that it's 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 fun looking at him in context <clears throat> because you can see i think the thing i enjoy about prince and this is something i try to express in my books is his he's not a guy who talked a lot to you know, the public but he expressed 
what he was thinking and feeling in his songs. And, and he would record two or three songs in a day. So you get um, a song in the morning, maybe it's a thoughtful song. And then in the afternoon, you get some more, you know, lighthearted stuff. Maybe he had a lunch that made him happy. And then the evening, he might do something because he got, he might be an angry song because he was mad about something else. But you can hear not only his, how or he saw a movie day. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he was inspired. And and I think that you, you're doing that much music, you're going to be inspired by what's around you. And you, you look for people telling stories or telling jokes, or walking across the floor and their heels go click, 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 click. And you're like, ooh, back on the drums. And And I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy him so much is because he um, is able to convey where he was at that moment with everything. Dwayne, something I heard you mention on another interview that I, I thought was so apropos, and that is that, and, you know, we're getting ahead of the story a little bit, but I want to mention this. You had said that when, when he passed in 2016, how it was just unreal to see the outpouring globally of how much love the world had for Prince and how it felt personal. And for me, it felt so personal because I followed him from day one. And, you know, some of the things that you may not know about me is that I met my wife because of Prince. We were both in a uh, AOL chat room back in 1994. That was called Paisley Park. I remember that chat room. And um, my son is named after Prince, not Prince, but Nathan Parker and my last name, Goldfine. So the initials are MPG. Nice. And Nate nice. because of Sign of the Times. Mm -hmm. And Parker because of Dorothy Parker. And, oh, my God. And, and Maceo and Parker. Park. Yeah, oh, my, that's great. How cool is uh, that? So he is so important um, and been so close to my life. And I saw him, you know, 30, 40 times at least perform. And from the first show at the Roxy on the West Coast uh, wow. in 79 and getting booed off the stage at the Rolling Stones, I was there. Mm -hmm. Oh my I was gosh. at the Long Beach Arena for the time and Vanity and him and Jeez. Uh, Glam Slam was in LA and I, I used was to go to Glam Slam. I, I went to Glam Slam all the time, so it probably were the, many of the same shows. I'm yeah. sure were you there that night when Stevie Wonder came up? No, but I, I saw when Stevie Wonder played with him in 2011. Okay. So I didn't I didn't go to Glam Slam but that night, but I, I missed you know yeah Glam Slam was great. Oh, it was awesome. But but the point is, it was so personal. I felt like a brother. Right. And then to see that scale of loss and, and observation and appreciation, I had mixed feelings about it because like you were saying in that other interview, it felt so close and personal to me. My wife feels the same way. Um, but at the same time, it was wonderful to see that sort of universal outpouring. I, you know, it's funny because I think about that a lot because a lot of us and at the time, 2016, <clears throat> His popularity had kind of, it wasn't his public popularity. He had, he had, you know, he wasn't releasing the hits anymore. You know, you, it had been years since you pull up to a, a stoplight and you hear a Prince song in the next car over. Used to be back in the day, you pull up to a stoplight, somebody's cranking, you know, Erotic City or something like that. And, and it didn't happen like that. If it did, it was a novelty because it just didn't happen. So when he passed, I thought I was in a more exclusive club, you know, some smaller club. And I was, I was really happy if there's a silver lining of any of this stuff to know that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't by myself mourning and, and celebrating and thinking about the guy, because I think uh, Bowie had died three months earlier and I actually cried when Bowie died because um, I was such a fan. But when Prince died, it was, it really was crushing. I think to a lot of people, because there's a way Prince had about, talking directly to the person. De Bowie didn't talk to me. He talked to the world. He was an artist and stuff like this. And you always knew there was a separation from Bowie and you. Prince, I got that too. But when he sang, he sang to you. When he talking in your headphones, he was talking to you. And there was this link. And if a guy can be playing in the studio by himself on everything and still give you goosebumps, he's sending out a frequency that you're getting. And if you're lucky enough to get this, you feel a bond and you feel connected and you talk to most Prince fans and they feel similar. They, they feel like, no, you don't understand. I'm a Prince fan, but I'm a Prince fan because he connected with, with me on, on a level that other artists didn't. Um, and so when he passed, seeing the world turn purple was, you know, it, it really, I think it made it a little easier for a lot of us 
it's five years on. And I think most of us are still in the first stage of grief. You know, we have not accepted that he's gone at any point. If he announced tomorrow, I'm back. I had to go five years because of something religious or whatever. We'd all go, oh, yeah, he's back. And, and, and we'd be there accepting it, you know, and because there was no looking back, we could see the signs that something was going on. But but at the time. No. You know, and, and the other sad thing for me is he was so he close He almost seemed immortal at that time. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why he, he kind of didn't plan on dying, you know, in many ways. He was like, I'm Prince. <laughs> and even now, it's funny because a lot of people have said this to me, and I, and I feel this too, is I so often get in the car. I listen to Sirius XM, and I turn on the radio, and a Prince song is on, or a Prince protege is on, or somebody he wrote songs for is on. Almost every day. Um, I find that when I'm talking to people, sometimes something about Prince will come up or, you know, it, it's, it's a very, it, it's very contemporary for a guy that's been gone five years that it's still happening. You still see magazine covers all the time with Prince on the cover. You still see <clears throat> 60 Minutes did a story a couple of weeks ago and you're going, oh my gosh, 60 Minutes is doing a story about this. It, it's, there's a, um, there's still an urgency and an interest and a, uh, it's not just he was, important he is important and i think that that a lot of people a lot of musicians still learn from him watching his videos while listening to his music when they come out with the box sets of things there's there's a hunger for this stuff please give me more and and uh i th i hope that lasts because it's it's i want my daughter to know this stuff and i want her daughter to know this stuff and 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 then it's 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 a cool club to be in you know I mean, that's, that's all I can, it's, it really, it's, you, you talk to a Prince fan, all of a sudden, you know, you got 75% in common. And you're just like, what room do you walk into in life with somebody and you go, hey, we believe, we agree with, on so we may disagree on everything else, but we got 75% in common right now. If we all had that, man, we'd get along well. Yeah, that would be great. So that's just me. Yeah, I agree with everything you said in your assessment of what we saw in 2016. And, um, but on the other hand, I was kind of thinking also at the time, you know, where were all so many of you when he was still putting out great music in the in the 90s and into the 2000s? He didn't go away. He was right. still there. Right. He was still pushing the envelope right. and still being more creative than almost anyone else out there and still putting stuff out regularly. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I the two things go to my head with that. First off, I think it'd be cool to have a greatest hits of his stuff after Warner Brothers. I would love to see a greatest hits of of he was a two CD like a, like the the hits album he did with all post Warner Brothers stuff because there's a lot of great stuff in there. Second off is uh, and something I'm forgetting at some I'm drawing a blank. Um, boy, it sounded like I was going to be smart there for a second. <laughs> it, it, whatever it is, it's it's. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, oh, I know what it was. To me, I can divide Prince's career into three spots, three three major eras. The Rebel, where he was pushing the envelope, and then Purple Rain hit, 1999 Purple Rain hit, and he was the superstar. And then I think he was the Rebel again because he all of a sudden said, The slave, slave and all that, thing. Yeah. And he started pushing back and saying, I'm not going to take it from you guys. I'm not mm -hmm. going to, I'm not going to be your guy. I'm going to do what I want to do. And the, you look at the, the things he did after that. He was like, you know what? I'm going to put albums on the seats at concerts and I'm going to sell them. And everybody's like, wait, what? You can do that? And he said, yep, I did it. And, and that kind of stuff was when you start pushing the envelope saying, I'm going to find a different way. I'm going to release this. I'm going to be independent. I'm not going to have, I'm going to own my masters. There's something about somebody that says, thank you for the ride. Now I'm going to be on my own. And, and he may not have sold like he did, but boy, you go back and you listen to some of the stuff he did and he was, he was pushing things. And again, sometimes I really like some of the stuff. And sometimes with any artist, you may go, you know what? Eh, it's not my thing. I'll meet you on the next one. And, and that's fine too, because I don't expect any artist and me to be on the same wavelength every time. And that's totally fine. You know, like I said, Bowie did a lot of albums. I was like, I'll listen to it once. But Prince, I think every album always had a song or two or three that I thought stood out that was exceptional. Um, and I think that, that people need to go back to some of the stuff he did later and and listen to it and, and find those nuggets and, and, and 
kind of appreciate the nice thing about when people can go back to those things it's like getting a new prince album you know they, they didn't know this stuff was out and if they're looking for more they can go oh there's a bunch of stuff he did in, in the uh you know 2000s and early 2010s that, that you know they're, they're really cool and the album that's coming out in the summer was recorded in 2011 and you know or 2010 and you're just like oh a whole album's coming out of stuff he didn't do in a release well that's that's kind of cool you know so that kind of stuff i i i think that prince is uh and the amount of stuff he did is always going to be surprising as it's released over time is my guess, you know, because this is, I think people did overlook him at a certain time and it was unfortunate at the time. Where were they? You know, I had, I had just bought um, his last album about a week or two before he passed away and I got it like a couple days before. Hit uh, and run. Uh, yeah. And I just, I just really got in a few days and I started listening going, oh, there's some cool, I mean, there's some stuff that I like and there's some stuff I'm going, eh. but there's some stuff I really liked. And then he passed away and I was like, I just had to rotate, rotate, rotate. Because by that point when he passed away, you were looking for anything with his voice on it, you know, because you realized, oh, the, the, the faucet is, is uh, turned off. Yeah, everyone deals with it differently. I guess my wife, she had a hard time listening to him for a while because it was going to make her so upset, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so yeah. Um, I, have, I have a friend, I have a friend that we go to, we went to see the revolution play a couple times. And he had to walk out of the room when there's plays sometimes it snows in April. And he literally said, I cannot and I understood he's like, it would be waterworks. And, and so he would say, you'll have to excuse me for a little bit, I'm going to you know, step out. But I, I, I agree with that. But I, I like the the um, being in a crowd with people is cathartic. And it, it helps me knowing that I'm not the only person. I didn't invent this grief, that it's everybody's feeling it. And you're kind of in a crowd and being and holding each other up. And I think that's, that's something I think we do now as fans is we all kind of support each other. We have to do the heavy lifting because the guy that did the lifting before can't do it now. So we kind of have to pay back for all the things he gave to us. That's why I say it. Yeah. Well, me too. And I had heard you send that other, uh, another interview too, about, you know, your motivation for doing this and wanting to give back because he gave us so much. And that resonated so much with me because that is completely why I do this show mm -hmm. and um, why I've done, you know, the book and just so much of what I do is motivated by just, I, I cannot give back enough because right. of Prince and some of the other artists have meant so much in my life and given so much. And, you know, not only do I want to give back, but I want to hopefully open up the ears and eyes to others to discover it and also, you know, have their souls enriched with that. Right. It's, it's Isn't it nice when you play something for somebody and they go, I, I didn't know this existed. This is great. And then you see them start running with it. And, oh, my God, this is the best. I've, I've turned several friends on to Prince. I've taken them to see Prince play or something like that. And they go, oh, oh. That's what you could, that's what it is. And there's just this joy in, in releasing somebody else into that. And, and, and I think that good music should be shared and, and you're absolutely right. It's fun when you can share this, build a bridge to the next generation. You know, uh, my daughter likes Manic Monday. Now she's 11. She hasn't, I don't, there's a lot of music by Prince. I don't want her hearing yet, <laughs> but what she's heard, she enjoys. She said the other day, uh, I'm never going to, I'm, I'll, I'll like Prince, but I don't think I'm ever going to be a big fan. I said, mm, you, know, you will. And I said, one day you'll be writing books. And she goes, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're going to carry on the family history here, right? <laughs> Our legacy of writing books about Prince. So well, my, I, my, I, yeah. my, my son's a fan too, although not, you know, anywhere to the level of, sure. of myself, but, but even if he's not that big of a fan, he really understands and appreciates the skill and nice. the ability and the accomplishment and, you know, that he was a one of a kind. Um, it's, it's, it's impossible to watch the guy and not realize it. I think it's, I think it's good to have somebody that can kind of guide you to the, the, the high points so you can appreciate it. I was in a, um, I was talking to a, working on a job. I think it was right when Prince passed away and they had a son that was about 13 or so, 13, maybe 14. And he, we were talking about why we were all sad. And he said, yeah, Prince is great, but he's no Kanye. And I was like, hmm, you're within choking distance. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, this is gonna be a phrase that you look back and, and regret saying, you know, cause I was like, yeah, I mean, Kanye's fun, but not 
prince. No, nobody's prince. It, it's just, just the way it is. Stevie Wonder's amazing. And I would never diss Stevie Wonder, but Prince is Prince. That's that. And, you know, and pretty much once you say that, people go, oh, yeah. Okay. Who's the greatest band of all time? Uh, Prince. Wait, that's not a band. Prince. You know, it, it's, it's just, who's the greatest bass player? Uh, probably Prince. Who's, who's the great guitar player? Prince. Oh, you know, and so it's, it's, I would put him up against almost anybody, you know, when it comes to almost every instrument because he just was so good. And the cool thing when I watch Prince play guitar or bass, it's an extension of him. This is me playing bass, of course. Um, it's an extension of him. It's like, it just looks like it, it, it grows out of him and it's fluid. And the thing I've been told is he would practice in front of the mirror all the time. And he would not just practice on the, the chords or the notes or anything like that, but on the look, on how he moved the guitar or how he'd hump the guitar or just his whole body would be moving. And, you know, like he just pulled, it seemed to pull music out of the air and transfer it out to the rest of us. And there, there was just something about that. There's a part in the, in the, uh, in the book that's coming out where one of the uh, musicians walked into the room and Prince is telling the story. There's the music playing in the recording se session and Prince is at the mixer telling a story. And he didn't realize that at the same time Prince is telling the story, he's playing keyboards, recording a keyboard track. Like he's telling this joke and he's like still playing it. Like he's got two different heads. And you just think, oh my God, how? And he said, it wasn't like he was telling the story to the beat. He was just telling the story and it was a funny story, but he's still doing the background track of whatever it was. And it just, you just go, usually that's something somebody goes, okay, quiet, please. I'm focusing. It was music. It was just music and pure. This is what he did. This is what he was put here to do. He was put here to share this with us. And it looked effortless, but the guy worked at it and worked at it, worked at it and made it so good and so easy for us to digest, you know, so. And he just absorbed the greats that had come before him oh, yeah. oh, and yeah. brought it together and distilled it in a totally unique way, but yeah. brought it all in. And, you know, I was at the um, Beverly Theater show of P-Funk in like 83 Three. when supposedly yeah. he was there and then went and did Erotic City mm -hmm. afterwards. And, you know, he would take in these influences. And when you talk about the instruments being an extension of him, I'm reminded of seeing him at the Santa Monica Civic in 85? Two? Oh, okay. Oh, the early it was one. a controversy. Okay, okay, controversy okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, he had come back and he was sort of like vindicating, you know, the year before getting booed off at the Coliseum by the Rolling mm -hmm. Stones. And he mm -hmm. comes into the Civic and blows the roof off that place. Mm -hmm. But at one point he was uh, during during head he's playing the keyboard synth and he's doing the guitar with the other hand at the same time and just mm -hmm. is the music you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's there's no separation between and I, you see a lot of musicians who are up there working music and they you know they're great but there was just this fluid thing to that he would then play the instrument and then moving and singing and guiding the band you know, they're all watching him. He's going, you know, bah, bah, bah. And, you know, it's just in him. And and it, it's it's very, you know, James Brown did the, the, you know, all that stuff very well. And Prince saw that and thought, ah, I got it. That's, that's, they'll do that. But the things he added, you add Sly into there. Like I said, Santana. You, But you even add B.B. King in there and and different people. You can, you can see all these different things he did. But he did it so smooth and so fluid, you know, and, and sometimes you see references when people, you know, that you could say, oh, that guy's completely ripped this person off. But the Prince, I don't think I ever saw that because he added whatever he brought to it. You know, he's like making a big pot of gumbo and throwing everything in and, and but he made it so tasty. And and the, the one of the cool things when I found it with listening to his music is how the tracks seem to just go together. And, you know, there's there's mistakes in there and things like this, but you don't hear it. You don't hear any of the problems because he, he knows what to bring up and what to accent and stuff like this. And, and there's just something about his ability to, to hear the song and put it on tape um, in a way that he can do in three hours that would take other people weeks to do. You know, a band comes in there and does drums for a day going, mm, I don't know yet. 
And I read, I read a book about Fleetwood Mac <clears throat> recording rumors, which is a great album, one of the greatest albums of all time. But it took him weeks and weeks and weeks just to do some of these tracks, and they're trying to figure it out. He comes in and doesn't really do a demo. Comes in and says, "Okay, I got this. Let me do, do, do drums, bass. Okay, I got guitar. Play this. Okay, now um, I think it was with Sign of the Times. Susan Rogers had said what he did with the recording. They recorded the basic tracks, and then he sang, and then he recorded guitar, and it was basically the guitar doing his singing for the parts he's not singing. So it's like it's hitting those same." points of a conversation but it's guitar so it's just his voice it's just an extent another instrument he uses you know whether it's falsetto or or using the pupusan to to make it deeper or, or or whatever it's all elements to make this song and 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 every element he used was perfect and he wasn't a perfectionist but he was just so damn good that it seemed like he was a perfectionist you know to me at least yeah you talk about the arrangements in some of those songs and deceptively simple a lot of them are but um they're not in actuality and how listening to those albums you would um have songs that took a while to grow in you because you couldn't fully digest it and necessarily appreciate it initially right. and there aren't that many artists out there that create works where repeated listenings bring that kind of reward right right no, I agree. I did, it's, I totally agree with with that because so many times you listen to like Parade when you first get Parade, which is a great album. It's like okay, I don't really get it yet. First listen, you're going, hmm, this is a this is a different thing. It's different than around the world today. And but then you start listening to more, and you got to get the headphones. And back in the day, it used to be headphones and beanbag chair, and and I would take an album and just listen to it for a week with the headphones and just kind of again soaking it all in. And I don't really can't really do that now with you know life, but back in the day when you to do that, you started to hear things in the background. It's like uh, kind of like I mean the the reference is is going to be. Uh, I'll explain this reference I'm about to make, but the music's completely different. It's like listening to certain Pink Floyd things. You know, you listen to certain Pink Floyds, and all of a sudden you're listening to headphones, and you hear things in the background that you didn't hear before, things that fit in the cracks. And I think Prince did that, not necessarily with new sound, but maybe a, a, a bass, just a, a little tickle on the bass or just, you know, a keyboard hit and homes, you know, and, and you, you know, there's just, he knew how to fill in the blanks or how to leave them as sparse as he needed to. And, and the vocal layering. Oh yeah. Oh, oh my God. Exactly. And, and he knew, and the cool thing is recording all the vocals by himself meant that he's given you an intimate performance. He's not doing a show for you. He's the engineer out of the room. It's him giving his own heartfelt performance. You know, he can do it in the dark, he can do it quietly. And he's sitting there at the, at the, the you gotta visualize him sitting at the mixer with the mic hanging down. And sometimes he'd have headphones on, sometimes they just say, turn it down and and he'd, he'd do it like that. And so he's gonna have some bleed from the music going through the headphones, but it wasn't about perfection engineering wise. It was about what came from his heart. And this is how he did it. So he could sit there and, and record this 25 times and go, you know what? 24 times it didn't work, but the 25th time is the one he wants you to have. And he erase over all his performances, but it's all his heartfelt expression of what the song is supposed to be. You know, whether he's singing it to his, his girlfriend, a friend who's mourning, whatever it is, it's what he wants. He's not doing a performance that he has. Nobody's looking at the clock saying, okay, Prince, that one's great. You know, he's like, ah, it's great, Prince. You know, it was more of he knew when he had it right. And that's the thing that is, is by the being the writer and producer and arranger and the musician on most of his stuff, he can give you something that's undiluted. And that is something that most musicians can't do because there's always some sort of filter on that. And I think Prince was able to give you something as unfiltered or at least filtered the way he wanted it to be because it was he always it wasn't like he just gave you anything he gave you what he wanted to give you you know and if and even if it's a great song like 17 days if it doesn't fit on purple rain b-side you know or not even coming out you know and, and you're going oh my god uh she's always in my hair great song b-side it's a freaking awesome song and he's like yeah there's no room on the album for that one and you're going 
most people would be not only would that be the first track, it'd be the first single, and that would be how they led their concert, and it'd be the first track on the greatest hits album. He's like, yeah, B side, I'll play it sometimes. Because he had so much great stuff that he could just do. Like you're saying, the arrangements seem simple, but if they're that simple, how come everybody didn't do them like that? Because mm -hmm. he did it. He knew how to do it. He knew what he wanted to say. He knew how to say it. So, yeah. I may stir up controversy in saying this, but um, for me, I always most appreciated the music he made in the studio by himself. Um, I was not crazy about outside influences <clears throat> and others. I thought he can do it all. I love what he does himself. And especially with, you know, the screams and the things he comes up on his own and the arrangements and the sounds, um, you know, I granted, you know, some of the revolution definitely gave him some help, give him some good ideas and things like that. But, um, when I would see him go back to just being him alone in the studio, I was like, yeah. Well, two things. First off, this interview's over. Click. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I think that I, I, I get it. Um, and there's a purity to what he brought by himself. Um, I also do appreciate what other people added to it just because I think when they would do something like... Um, um, well, I mean, half of Purple Rain was done with the band. Purple Rain, the song was done with the band. Um, uh, you know, so Let's Go Crazy is done with the band. Um, there's a, a magic that he's able to capture by himself, but also with the people, because they all know they're trying to please Prince. There's a leader. And if something's not working, he's going to say, enough of that. Um, so it's almost like they become extensions of him and blend their DNA with what he's doing. But I get what you're saying is, is the guy's capable of doing everything on his own. And, and some of his solo stuff is fantastic. But then again, I loved Eric Leeds on sax. And so well, he, he, could, he, yeah. he couldn't do that. And so he brings in Eric Leeds, brings in, you know, different people that can play something. Lisa Coleman does things on the piano that he could never do. And as odd as that sounds... There was a, and you've, you've interviewed Lisa. Um, uh, there's things she would bring to him that he would go, oh, I don't know how to do that. And that's shocking to say for somebody like Prince. But even he said that, you know, there's, there's a thing that she could do that he had to figure out. And he probably did figure it out eventually because he's a sponge. Um, but she brought a, a sound and a layer to things like that that, that elevated him. And I think that sometimes if you had a band that's like the revolution or the NPG that would, would inspire him. Data bank is inspired by, uh, it was a uh, Brown Mark riff and it's a great song, you know, da, 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 and it's, it's a fun thing to it, but that's Brown Mark brought that. And he was rehearsing it one day and, and Prince came and says, Oh, that's great. Let me play with that. And before he knew it, he turned it into a song and Mark's like, wait, wait, that was, that was my song, you know? And, I think that there's sometimes that he could bring in the influences and then make them his. Um, but I get what you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying. If, if the guy can do it, let him do it. You know, and, and, yeah. and I, yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate how they helped inform him with mm -hmm. some of those ideas right. and, 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 and stretched his musical sure. Sure. palette, you know, for sure. Right. Um, but yeah. Um, well, who else could? I mean, so who's who else could go in the studio like that? Stevie Wonder could. Paul McCartney can. I'm trying to think of other people that would go in the studio and record an album that's that's profound and great and danceable and and all this other stuff. There's not a lot of people that can really do that and do it over and over and over. When you talk about, you know, you're saying he was an perfectionist, like a Stevie Wonder it could take forever to yes, like. Yes, exactly. You know, do something so yeah and, and i think that's the thing that's about prince is not only was he good but he's fast and and he could get this stuff done and and there's just something about that that you, you, you got to respect you know is is this was a, a job for him but it was also a pleasure for them i think that that's how he communicated there's a story in the um in the second book where he was laughing about something and he said they were doing some track i, I don't think i knew what track it was but he's talking to one of his assistant engineer and he said, we should do a TV show called Drum Talk. 
He goes, what drum talk? I said, yeah, two drummers sitting there talking, but just with drums. And they have a conversation between two well-known drummers with no words. And I thought, that's kind of fun. And I think that's the level he thought of is the communication he had with other musicians was his friendships and those were his relationships. And if you could relate to him on that music level, you were part of his family. And if you couldn't, you're probably always outside that circle. You know, he could have you, but there's a trust with having other people play with him that was important to his, his work. And so the people that he did allow on stage with him and the people he did allow in the studio with him, he trusted enough to bring them in. And so um, I think there's a, a charm and a, a, a respect that he had for these people or else you wouldn't be, you'd be in there once. And then he would say, yeah, it didn't. I think he said before on some of you, there's a difference between jamming and drowning. And he said a lot of people you saw drowning. And I think his best bands knew how to jam and take the, the, the a great riff, add some, you know, chicken grease to it and make it this really cool thing that you can't help but, you know, even me dancing. So you know, that, that's just something about that. And so I think also I just liked him live. So and, and the live was always with somebody. So, you know. Oh yeah, we can't yeah. dispute that for sure. Oh, no, yeah. I um, mean, it, look at a live performer. It's a live performer, man. It, it's the, the sad thing is, there's people that will that never got to see him, and seeing him on video is cool. But you know, sitting in the arena, ah. Oh. You know, I, I, there, there's nobody that I had ever actually spent hours waiting in line for a ticket. He was the only one, and. I spent six hours on Wilshire Boulevard waiting for the Wiltern show in 86, yeah, for 86. the parade show. Yeah. And, and yeah. he didn't tour, as you know, on that. I do. So yeah. uh, getting to see him was pretty special for that tour. And uh, as soon as I got my ticket, I think they're like 20 bucks. I had someone offering me 200 a piece. I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, I remember if you went to the Glam Slam, you probably stood outside in the cold many nights. Uh, just you park outside the, the club and you're just sitting there. You don't want to take your jacket in there because then you're going to be schlepping around this jacket all night, this big heavy thing. So you're standing in the cold for an hour hoping to get into the club, you know, and then and then you get in. Prince is supposed to play. You get up there and you try to get up to the front, which we all did. And there'd be his guitar on stage. And then you wait until three or four in the morning. You go, He's, I got to get up for work. And then he wouldn't play. And then you get the next friend that said the next day, ah, oh, at five in the morning, he got up and played. And you're like, ah, I just missed yeah. it. Yeah. And I think that happened to all of us at least once. And you say, I waited in the rain. I was, uh, I had to pee the whole time because I couldn't move because I'm against the stage. And if I moved, I'd lose my spot. So we all did that many times. And, and, but the times you got to see him, boy, that paid off. Oh, that was that worth paid it. Off. Yeah. Oh. Did you see uh, Glam Slam Ulysses when it played? Yeah. Carmen. Okay, yeah. Yeah. You're one of the ones that saw that too. Yeah. Yeah. Could have been, be been better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could have been a little better. Yeah. yeah. I, was but, there. I, think, but, I think I still have the lanyard, but yeah. I, I, I have the flyer still, you know, the blue flyer for that. Yeah. And I, the cool thing is, and another thing is uh, people don't understand back in the day when Glam Slam started, it was a small club. Carmen would be in the club a lot and you'd go in there and she'd be hanging out and you could talk to her and, as a fan, there was so many cool things. And, and you know, like Carmen would play or, uh, you know, different bands would come and play there. And you're just going, this is a cool place to go just in general. But you always hope that Prince would show up. I mean, that's the, that was the draw. But boy, having a club like that in, in town. Was it, nice. it was so fantastic because, you know, in the late 80s, really started becoming aware of and hearing about his after shows. Mm -hmm. You know, he's doing a lot of them in Europe, especially. Uh, and, you know, getting bootlegs of the recordings and, and only hearing them that way. And, yes. and to be able to actually then see him in an environment that was basically like an after show repeatedly was just heaven. Seeing him do songs like Race and stuff like that for the first time where you're going, I've never heard this song. I don't know anything about this. And, and knowing that you're, you're seeing something that nobody knows about is really, there was a connection there. And standing, you know, 10 feet from the guy who was playing guitar almost in your face and you're going this is just you you can watch somebody up from an arena and you see this person on stage but if you're standing there in a small club with this person and you know my taste acting like she's going to do a stage dive off the off the stage and stuff like this man that's fun 
<laughs> Boy, that that was worth staying up that late every you know those nights and missing and going knowing I got to go to work the next day. I'm gonna be. I, should I just stay up all night? Yeah. <laughs> or should I? You know, because you're like, I got. I'm gonna get two hours of sleep, or I can just kind of drink some coffee and go to work and just say, oh, I've got a headache today. I don't know what's going on. And, we and, and most people at work that I would tell if that was the reason would think I was totally insane. Mm -hmm. You know, because oh, they weren't but, Prince right. fans. Yeah. Oh, and you had you probably had two or three people that would stand in there, would you? I had a couple of people that would go, Prince is playing tonight. All right, I'll go. You know, and, and you, you knew that you had a little group. I did it myself, though, too. I'm, I've been to concerts by myself before. You know, when you did the uh, the run in, at the Universal Amphitheater for several nights, I went every night for that. Um, and then, you know, you're hoping that he better go to Glam Slam after that. And you're like, how do I get there fast enough? You know, so it, it was Los Angeles is a great town to be in if you're a Prince fan because it was often he'd always been played. Sure, he played. The, the, the worst part is that you could never keep up with everywhere he was going to play. And you kind of almost had to miss something. Yes. But the one night alone uh, show was okay. really a great day where he did the, the rehearsal, the show, and then the after show at the right. House of Blues. Right. And you're talking about, you know, the endurance test mm -hmm. uh, at that last show at the House of Blues. Me and my wife took that in on her knees pretty much on the floor. I mean, she was <laughs> spent. You know, but just phenomenal. And hearing him do Calhoun Square and stuff mm -hmm. like that that I hadn't heard before. Oh, man. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's there's so many cool songs he does. And and he will throw them out occasionally with a, a little pepper of this, a little salt of that. And you're just going, oh, my God, I'm, I'm hearing him do a song that I know he's not going to do again. And especially the clubs, you know, whether it's a B.B. A, a King cover or, or, you know, or just going to a jam and just old school funk jam. And you're just going... Oh my God, he's doing the Ohio players. Oh my God, he's doing Star Guard. You know, or whatever. And you're going, how, how on earth did, did did this happen? You know, that's that's the fun to me is is never knowing where the riff was going to come from and and how he'd bend it. And oh, there's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you've already done so. Please share it with friends and become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.